This module is part of the Satellite Foundation course for JPSS and is a general introduction to microwave remote sensing with a focus on passive sensing. This will help put into perspective how microwave remote sensing complements visible and infrared observation and why it's important. We'll look briefly at the properties that influence the interpretation of microwave measurements. One of the benefits of microwave imagery is the unique products that are produced. Total precipitable water, shown here, cloud liquid water, and rain rate, and sea surface wind speed, and sea surface temperature and soil moisture information is incorporated into analysis and modeling activities. This module gives an introduction as to how this is possible. The instruments used in microwave remote sensing include both imagers and sounders. Images are designed to gather high resolution detail in the horizontal. Sounders are designed to capture detail in the vertical. Sounders tend to have more channels than imagers. For example, the ATMS versus C Amser. The ATMS is the Advanced Technology Microwave Sounder. The Advanced Microwave Scanning Radiometer is Amser. The channels are strategically placed to measure properties at various heights in the atmosphere so that the end result is a 3D view. Microwave sensors can be further divided into passive and active sensors. The microwave energy detected by a passive sensor is a combination of radiation emitted by the atmosphere, that naturally emitted from the Earth's surface, and transmitted radiation. The amount of naturally emitted microwave radiation is generally quite small, so active sensors provide their own source of radiation and the backscattered signal is measured. In this module, the focus is on passive sensors. For a polar orbiting satellite, a point on the Earth can be imaged 12 hours apart, once during the day and the other at night. One will be a descending pass and the other an ascending pass. There is currently no microwave instrumentation in geostationary orbit. Microwave imagery can view all weather conditions, which include clear, as well as when there are non-precipitating and precipitating clouds. This enhances our observations and understanding of the weather. In a constellation module of this foundation course, more information will be provided about the orbit and swath width of particular satellites and instruments used in microwave remote sensing. This slide orients the microwave region within the electromagnetic spectrum. Note that the wavelengths in this region are on the order of centimeters. As shown here, wavelength increases from left to right, which is what the operational community uses for units in the infrared. Radiation can also be expressed in terms of energy or frequency, which is inversely proportional to wavelength. From the IR perspective, the operational IR perspective frequency is backwards. For historical reasons, it is most common to use frequency rather than wavelength as a unit, and it's often expressed in gigahertz. The frequency range most used for meteorological applications ranges from 1 to 200 gigahertz. Emitted microwave energy is less than in the infrared region of the spectrum and decreases with increasing frequency. The remote sensing of longer wavelengths requires a larger optical lens as well as a large receiving antenna. How far the sensor is from the source also contributes to the size of the lens and the antenna. These are some of the reasons why it's been challenging to get a microwave sensor on geostationary orbit. Currently, microwave is only on low Earth and polar orbiting satellites. Spatial resolution is generally coarser for microwave products than infrared products. This zoomed-in region of the microwave spectrum shows the vertical transmittance to space for a standard mid-latitude cloud-free atmosphere on the y-axis. The frequency range on the x-axis goes from large to small. If the atmosphere were completely transparent to microwave energy, this graph would show a horizontal line across the top near the value 1. It shows the major absorbing regions of oxygen and water vapor that are used in atmospheric temperature and moisture profiles, and the window regions where the surface can be observed. 
The observed brightness temperatures are influenced by absorption and emission properties, transmission, and scattering. For a clear sky or one that has non-precipitating clouds, the dominant properties are absorption, emission, and transmission, shown here above the purple line. Non-precipitating clouds are transparent in the microwave because cloud droplets, which are less than 0.1 millimeter are much smaller than the microwave wavelengths at centimeters so that the scattering is negligible. However, scattering has an important role in detecting ocean surface winds and when precipitating clouds are present. For the latter, it's similar to surface-based radar concepts in determining precipitation type and rain rate. These processes are shown here below the purple line. More information will be presented in the modules on winds and the influence of clouds and precipitation, respectively. This and the next three slides show example microwave channel imagery. The channels are from the Advanced Technology Microwave Sounder, or ATMS. This is the 31.4 GHz window channel. For interpretation of what is shown here, it is important to note that land emissivity is variable with a high mean value around 0.95, and ocean water emissivity is more consistent but with a low value around 0.5. The ocean emissivity in particular makes detection and measurement of atmospheric phenomena far easier over the ocean than the land due to the high contrast between the relatively cold background of the low emissivity ocean surface and the warmer emission from the falling rain. In this view of the surface, notice the temperature range from 150 to 300 degrees Kelvin and where those values are located. Do these make sense? From a normal IR perspective, no. So if we look at a land surface and its value is around 300 K with an emissivity of 0.95, the sensor observed temperature will be 285 which is within the ballpark of what we we're seeing over the land surface there for the green value. For an ocean surface, again, if we use 300 K as our estimate, with an emissivity of 0.5, the sensor observed temperature would be 150 K, which is within the ballpark of what we are seeing for the coldest temperatures over the ocean for this blue color. The warm green blob here over the ocean is Hurricane Maria. From the same ATMS swath, this is the 88 gigahertz channel with the same color bar as the previous slide. Recall from the mid-latitude microwave spectrum graph shown previously that transmittance at this frequency is 0.8 due to contamination by water vapor. Notice there are no very cold blue values. There is moisture above the surface which is absorbing and re-emitting at a warmer temperature. Over the ocean, what we saw as cold, clear blue regions in the previous image are now warmer, so this channel can be readily compared with the previous channel to derive a moisture component. The eye and bands of Hurricane Maria are more easily discernible to the east of the Bahamas. There are differences between the precipitating clouds, the non-precipitating clouds, and the clear, moisture-laden regions, causing them to stand out. We don't see this distinction over land surfaces because the high emissivity of the surface essentially overwhelms the cloud signal. It doesn't mean we can't work with it, it just means it's a little bit more difficult. This band at 183 gigahertz from the ATMS for the same swath and having the same color bar as the previous slide is in the water vapor absorption region and is generally insensitive to surface emissivity. If we took off the map, we could not readily distinguish between land and water. In a general sense, this is similar to the water vapor channels in the infrared. Because of sensitivities to precipitating and non-precipitating clouds and moisture regions, we can discern eye and bands from Hurricane Maria. Here is another image from ATMS for the 57.3 gigahertz channel covering the same area and having the same color bar. This is in the oxygen absorption region and corresponds to the upper troposphere around 300 millibars. You notice that it would be very difficult to discern that there is a tropical cyclone. In the next module on absorption, there will be a brief overview on obtaining moisture and temperature profiles with the oxygen and water vapor channels. Microwave information can also be displayed in vertical profiles. Here is an example of humidity profiles derived from the Advanced Technology Microwave Sounder. This graph also shows that this information can be merged with the Crosstrack Infrared Sounder, which is another instrument on polar orbiting satellites. 
These combined obtain a more detailed humidity profile representation. The vertical profile information is an output of the NOAA Unique Combined Atmospheric Processing System, or NUCAPS, which is already in AWIPS and will be discussed in an application module. An often overlooked but important use of microwave data is the assimilation into numerical weather prediction models. The graph shows the percent improvement from 1981 to 2017 for the 500 hectopascal geopotential height anomaly correlation for various forecast ranges. Before 2001, there was a large spread between the northern and the southern hemisphere forecasts. The AMSU-A instrument was launched in 1998 on NOAA-15. It and successor instruments closed the gap between the Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere performance. This is mainly due to channels from the 50 to 55 gigahertz range, which are sensitive to the atmospheric temperature profile and thus the 500 millibar height in both clear skies and clouds. So that was a very quick tour of passive microwave remote sensing. To summarize, let's review the advantages and limitations. The major advantage of microwave remote sensing is its use even in the presence of clouds. Microwave is sensitive to important phenomena such as precipitation type and rate, ocean surface winds, sea ice presence, and soil moisture. These are not readily obtainable with visible and IR measurements. The last two advantages listed here attest to the microwave ability to enhance temperature and moisture profile information, particularly over the ocean. Drawbacks to the microwave band for remote sensing are that the longer wavelengths limit the spatial resolution, the variations in land emissivity complicate interpretation, and the observations are not as frequent as from a geostationary satellite. Follow-on modules in this series will build on many of these topics further, introducing current microwave sensors in orbit and example imagery highlighting the product applications. Here are a list of resources and they are also posted on the web page for this module.